What's up, YouTube? Now I have a lot to talk about in this video. I haven't had a chance to record anything yet because with everything going on, people working from home, there's less opportunities to actually record with quiet. And I don't want a bunch of noise in the background, so... Yeah, I know I just made a brief video about this, but I actually want to talk about it. Of course, four sixes, because... You know, three wasn't enough for them, but... The whole contact tracing thing they've been pushing... Yeah, that's just PR... Crap. They can't call it... Orwellian, they can't call it... Um... Invasion of privacy, they can't call it... Tracking... Or... Surveillance... Or spying... Because that's really what it is. It's spying. It's just a PR tactic that, like, there's, like, EA, the video game company, for example, did something very similar to this, like, within the past few years, I think. They have loot boxes, which is basically glorified gambling, and people that are younger than 18 can do it, so there's this big deal about it, like, once people are investigating them. And they tried to change the, the term loot boxes that had a negative connotation, and they're like, no, it's surprise mechanics or something like that. And I'm making air quotes right now. And they tried to make it something that sounded more positive that didn't already have a negative connotation to try to get away with basically having glorified gambling in their games that people, and using dopamine um, manipulation basically to get extra money. Now, the government is kind of doing the same thing, or at least in news sources and stuff. Instead of, it's just a PR tactic. Instead of calling it surveillance, they say contact tracing because there's no negative connotation with contact tracing, so it sounds like, it doesn't sound like as bad of a thing, even though it is, so I'm not even gonna call it that, I'm gonna just call it surveillance, I'll say it how it is, it's Orwellian surveillance, or something to that extent, and I know this hasn't passed even the house yet, it still just got introduced, but I wouldn't be surprised if it gets further, so that's why I wanted to bring this up, but I've, since I haven't had a chance to make a video about this, I have so much stuff to go through. A lot of it isn't even new information or anything, but I just wanted to go through it and eventually get, like, everything I've researched out. So, of course, like, Event 201, if you go on DuckDuckGo, DuckDuckGo has almost become, like, a Google Lite. It's like, yeah, per the privacy and whatever is better, but as far as search results, like, the propaganda is, like, the first result when I search this. I won't even, like, let me highlight this, right? I don't highlight everything else, like... Ugh, whatever. You know what I mean. It's uh, Event 201, the first result. Event 201 didn't predict the COVID-19 pandemic, even though it happened a few weeks before. Then go to Wikipedia, they pulled, they pulled the same stuff. John Hopkins Center for Health Security and Partnership with the World Economic Forum and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation hosted Event 201, high-level pandemic tabletop exercise on October 18th, 2019. Before the whole thing happened, weeks or months before it happened, so the exercise illustrated areas where public and private partnerships will be necessary during their response in a severe coronavirus pandemic in order to diminish so large scale economic and societal consequences. But of course, that's all a coincidence, right? Everything's a coincidence. And of course, the WHO was involved in it. And of course, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Actually, I should say Gil Bates because, you know, that, that might be what I'm gonna call them because I don't want YouTube to just, like, remove the video, you know? They're like, you can't talk bad about Gil Bates. It's, it's hard to say that now because, you know, you have to change up the words you say or else stuff will probably get removed. But, but the potential impact of the fictional virus are not similar to that. If you actually watch the thing, I'm gonna try to put a clip in it right now, but... If you actually watch the thing, there's a lot of similarities, and there's some similarities to how they reacted to it as well. Of course, there's Atlantic Storm, Dark Winter, all sorts of other stuff they've done too. But yeah, six weeks before the first case in Wuhan. It's pandemic tabletop exercise, exercise. Yeah, hosted by, yeah, basically saying the same stuff. It doesn't say important policy issues and preparedness that can be solved with political and attention, signed in and actively engage and educate participants in the audience. And here are some of the videos and stuff. This article doesn't really get into that much stuff, though. So. 
It began in healthy looking pigs months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. The sickest required intensive care, many died. Experts agree, unless it is quickly controlled, it could lead to a severe pandemic, an outbreak that circles the globe and affects people everywhere. The mission of the Pandemic Emergency Board is to provide recommendations to deal with the major global challenges arising in response to an unfolding pandemic. The board is comprised of highly experienced leaders from business, public health, and civil society. We're at the start of what's looking like it will be a severe pandemic. And there are problems emerging that can only be solved by global business and governments working together. We have known about caps-like viruses in animals and people for decades, but have not been successful at developing a licensed vaccine. I'm sure there are new technologies that may help, but it's going to be difficult. I am not optimistic about having a vaccine in time to be relevant during this pandemic. So the policy crisis in question for this board in this meeting is this. How should governments, business, and international organizations allocate and distribute pandemic antivirals and medical supplies to the people who need them most. What we've seen work uh, very well in the HIV field is in fact procurement through the Global Fund. So having a centralized mechanism, so financial, financially able to procure on behalf of affected countries okay. would be critical. I think the second thing, the second thing is um, it's gonna be very important that for the business sector, for manufacturers of anti antivirals that we have clarity around what the need is and where the need is and who are making the decisions. A global stockpile would certainly help ensure more rational and strategic allocation, but the reality is that we don't have the logistics capability, even within the UN, to bring that together in one place and run it. So this is where I think a collaboration between the international organizations like the World Health Organization and the private sector, which runs these supply chains for many purposes every day, understand where the supplies are, make smart decisions about how to allocate them to the people who need them in the places that need them the most, and then work with the industry to move those supplies from where they are today to where they need to be. Just to underscore the point that cooperation among supply chain providers or businesses that have huge supply chains mm -hmm. can add a lot of efficiency to the whole process. The question is, can you, through this international mechanism, really promote commitments to doing this as quickly as possible and give people a sense that actually if they contribute more, that they will have a, a better chance of protecting their own populations and their country's security and health. So to be completely clear, most uh, of this production would already be committed in contracts. Yes. Uh, it is almost unheard of that people are producing product without having a forward commitment for the consumption of that product. So the first thing that needs to be done, because this is not something that the countries currently control, unless countries are going to bring about emergency situations and co-opt an existing supply chain. Public health agencies have issued travel advisories, while some countries have banned travel from the worst affected areas. As a result, the travel sector is taking a huge hit. Travel bookings are down 45% and many flights have been cancelled. A ripple effect is racing through the service sector. Governments that rely on travel and tourism as a large part of their economies are being hit particularly hard. How should national leaders, businesses and international organizations balance the risk of worsening disease that would be caused by the continued movement of people around the world against the risks of profound economic consequence of travel and trade bans. What is essential, what is non-essential travel, we have to clarify this. Otherwise, if we go down to 20% bookings over a long period, the company will run down. That's a fact. You know, there's a whole complex set of issues in a highly interdependent world on supply chains that are just in time. We need to think about how much flex there is in that just-in-time supply chain system and make sure it keeps running. 
I think it's going to take specificity, and it's going to take knowledge that only the private sector has. The UN can play an important coordinating facilitation role, but the companies know where those commodities are, where they move, how to move them, and that's where a, a, a type of public-private collaboration that we have not generally had in these crises needs to be put together pretty quickly. We are not out of money yet, but the fact is we are trending in a dangerous direction and something needs to change. So the policy question for this board now is how should financial resources be prioritized? Are there nodes that we cannot allow to fail? What is your sense of priorities? We don't have money to pay for all of these urgent problems. So at the moment, we want the funds, right? You need the money. So where's the money? So government kind of supplies our money. A lot of, you know, private sectors, you know, some are sitting here, you have some money. But now you need a really coordinated, centralized approach. The hotels will be, will be experiencing, you know, crippling losses during that. And we know that the hotel business in itself makes up 5% of the GDP. Governments need to be willing to do things that are out of their historical perspective. Or, for the most part, it's, it's really a, a war footing that we need to be on. We shouldn't underestimate the uh, power of entrepreneurship. We need to escalate that, whether it's through you know, the governments um, helping with tax breaks or you know, subsidies of that nature to, to, to increase manufacturing of those types of products. It can happen quickly. A Marshall-type plan, uh, you know, I don't mean to say that exactly, but a Marshall plan mm -hmm. that can go into effect uh, can stimulate uh, change very quickly. Countries are reacting in different ways as to how best to manage the overwhelming amounts of dis and misinformation circulating over the internet. In some cases, limited internet shutdowns are being implemented to quell panic. How much control of information should there be? And by whom? And how can false information be effectively challenged? And what if that false information is coming from companies or from governments? I think it's very important that we make sure that there is concise communication with all healthcare facilities where these patients are being treated so that there isn't mass panic. We're at a moment where the social media platforms have to step forward and recognize the moment to assert that they're a technology platform and not a broadcaster is, is over. Um, they, in fact, have to be a participant in broadcasting accurate information and partnering with the scientific and health communities mm -hmm. to counterweight, if not flood the zone, of accurate information. Because to, try to put the genie back in the bottle of the misinformation and disinformation is nigh impossible. The outcome of the CAPS pandemic in event 201 was catastrophic. 65 million people died in the first 18 months. The outbreak was small at first and initially seemed controllable, but then it started spreading in densely crowded and impoverished neighborhoods of megacities. From that point on, the spread of the disease was explosive. Within six months, cases were occurring in nearly every country. The global economy was in a free fall. The GDP down 11 percent. Stock markets around the world plummeted between 20 and 40 percent and headed into a downward cycle of fear and low expectation. Businesses were not borrowing. Banks were not lending. Everyone was just hoping to hunker down and weather the storm. Economists say the economic turmoil caused by such a pandemic will last for years, perhaps a decade. The societal impacts, the loss of faith in government, the distrust of news, and the breakdown of social cohesion could last even longer. We have to ask, did this need to be so bad? Are there things we could have done in the five to ten years leading up to the pandemic that would have lessened the catastrophic consequences? We believe the answer is yes. So are we, as a global community, now finally ready to do the hard work needed to prepare for the next pandemic. UN Agenda 2030. Originally there was Agenda 21 and now it's 2020 already, so I guess they just went straight into 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I know I'm kind of talking fast, but I want to get through as much information as I can. 
Honestly, I'm not even slowing up my voice as I, after I edit this and whatever. So yeah, let's go, just go through some of these points. Transforming, blah, 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 blah. Go on end poverty in all its forms everywhere. You can understand why I'm going through this stuff in a little bit. And hunger achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable arc agriculture. So, yeah, let's put a bunch of GMOs in food and a bunch of chemicals, spray them in the sky. And yeah, that sounds like sustainable a agriculture. I can't talk today. Yeah. To healthy lives and promote well-being for all. At all ages, it sound, a lot of this stuff sounds decent on the surface until you like really dig deep into it. Ensure inclusive and equitable quality education to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. That's kind of when it starts getting to a lot of the buzzwords you hear a lot, like the words that make people feel good. Inclusive, equ equitable, quality, equality. All these words that they use a thousand times, they just keep saying the same words over and over and over and over. If you say something enough times, it's going to affect people. So, keep gender equality and empower all women and girls. That's a completely different video right there. I'm not, I'm not even going to touch that right now. Ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Yeah, like dumping oil into every fresh water source you can find, you know, right? Well, not all of them, but you get the point. That, that sounds like... But yeah, it's like... They already dumped oil into so many good sources, like, how many sources are there that aren't corrupt now, like, I have no idea, probably not many, but that's all our fault for ruining the planet, right, and the old good old UN, that government system that loves us is all gonna help us, right, sarcasm again, ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy, energy for all, promote sustained, inclusive, more buzzword, right, the, another use of that buzzword, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. Build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and... They use that word like almost every single time at this point. And sustainable industrialization, yeah, industrialization and foster innovation. Reduce inequality within and among countries. Make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, reliant, and sustainable. Yeah, they do use the word sustainable quite a bit. So yeah, capable of being continued with minimal long-term effect on the environment is one definition. And it's like the whole thing where they care more about the environment than they care about people's health. Like, people aren't willing to sacrifice their, some people are willing to sacrifice like their own health just for the sake of the environment and so it's ridiculous. Ensure sustain, sustainable consumption and production patterns. Urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. Even though they've done more research about outer space than they have our own oceans, supposedly. Air quotes. I'm not getting into that right now either. Protect, restore, and promote sustainable. They all they keep using sustainable. Sustainably managed forest combat, desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. For peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions on a level. Strengthen the means of implement implementation and revitalize partnerships for sustainable development. Eventually, I'm going to go through all of those things and tie them in, to see what it actually really means. But for now, it's plan for the people, promote planet and prosperity. Also, seeks to strengthen universal peace and larger freedom. Recognize that eradicating poverty in all forms and dimensions, including extreme poverty, is the greatest global challenge and an, an, an indispensable requirement for sustainable development. Now here's where it gets crazy. 
All countries and all stakeholders acting in collaborative partnership will implement this plan where we will to free the human free the human race from the tyranny of poverty and want to heal and secure our planet. And the tyranny of poverty, that's kind of rich that the UN is using the word tyranny. Let's unjust or oppressive government of power, a government in which single ruler does to office authority or jurisdiction of the Yeah, we'll get into that. That first definition definitely describes what we're going to be seeing here with that. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly tie this in. I'm going to go into all those things eventually. Social and technological progress occurs in harmony with nature and trust. Urgent action on climate change so the top 1% of the people can keep using all our private jets and, you know, doing all that stuff while the poor people are expected to, and middle class people are expected to, start using less energy because it's all our fault and the rich people using the major vast majority of the energy, they can keep doing that, but we're all the ones that need to change everything. That That's complete garbage. That's what they, that's what they say, though, but it's complete garbage. And there's ID2020. Identity is vital for political, economic, and social opportunity, but systems of blah, blah, blah. And we need to get right all this garbage. 1.1 billion people worldwide live without a digital ID. Always find a way to highlight stuff. Ethical privacy protecting approach. Yeah, just be more PR crap. One in seven people globally who lacks means to pr prove their identity. Participate in the modern economy, which is going to be completely shifting. With all the, with probably physical money going away pretty soon. Back where it belongs in the hands of the... No, that's, that's a complete lie. See, and then they're gonna do the whole convenience thing, and people are willing to sacrifice so much for convenience, like so many freedoms just for convenience, and there's so many past things, passports, work, thing, credit cards, all this stuff. And then they want you to just have one thing, a digital ID to keep track of literally every single person in the world that's what they want to do and they say i've called and they say all this good stuff but they even call it a certification mark of the beast <laughs> it might be it might not be i'm just throwing that out there or it could be a precursor on it but yeah they literally even call it a mark right there like and it could be just like a type of thing that's like, it could be something else in this just to throw people off, but, I don't know. And of course, oh, who's that right there? Microsoft? Shocker, right? The old date says his hands and everything. Of course, I was, there was that Netflix documentary that he's like, A worldwide pan pandemic is gonna be the worst thing and you can't, we're not ready, blah, blah, blah. And then it happens, like, soon after, like. Everything's just a coincidence, right, people? <laughs> Here's exactly what I was looking for. The 060606, like, I don't think just because that's there means that every single thing is, like, a mark, obviously, it can't be, you know, but it, they could all be precursors to it or part of the system that will give you said mark, you know? Cryptocurrency system using body activity data. Hmm, let's see, Microsoft Technology yeah, Microsoft Technology Licensing LLC. What a shocker! And I know this isn't something that's newly discovered. It's been like weeks, or maybe even a month since people found this originally. But I just wanted to make a video finally now that I can talk. Human activity. Let's let's read the abstract. Human activity associ yeah. human body activity associated with a task provided to a user may be used in the mining process of a cryptocurrency system. A server may provide a task to a device 
of a user which is communicatively, communicatively coupled to the server. A sensor communicatively, that's a hard word to say. Communicatively covered, coupled to, a comp, to or compromised in the device of the user may sense, sense body activity of the user. So basically like, Fitbits, Apple Watches, all that garbage that already exists, but worse. Body activity may be generated based on sensing body activity of the user. The cryptocurrency system communicatively coupled to the device of the user may verify if the body activity data satisfies one or more conditions set by the cryptocurrency system and award cryptocurrency to the user whose body activity data is verified. So it's more incentive. This is just more incentive to start using that kind of stuff. And oh, look at the publication date. March 26, 2020. Well, that's convenient, right? That's dumb highlighting thing. But yeah, that's convenient timing, right? It just goes back to this. Like, this thing, I didn't go in depth with this, but earlier, the whole this bill, but in related activities through mobile help units as and as necessary at individuals' residences. So it's like they want to track you, like, everywhere and be able to go to your house and stuff like it's ridiculous and like this is all tied to it's all tied together man like it's interesting that also um msoft or gil bates is associated to almost every single one of these here it is what the heck here it is right there that stupid blue thing would disappear from the page like come on but fundamental and universal human right this thing what the? Dude. Article 6 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights stipulates that everyone has the right to recognition everywhere. Person before the law. The sustainable development goals. There you go right there. Include target 16.9, which aims to provide legal identity to all, including birth registration by 2030. Promote peaceful and inclusive societies. Sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. And there you go, it is right there. By 2030, provide legal identity for all, including birth registration. And here's something that's actually a very good thing, end abuse, exploitation, trafficking, in all forms of violence against and torture of children. But how are you going to do that? Like, if you get rid of, like, bad guys, so to speak, it's like... There's just going to be more people that are going to pop up, like always. How do you make sure that that is completely eradicated? Oh yeah, by literally tracking every single person, everything they do. Like a complete Orwellian surveillance state. Like, that's the, that's the solution they're going to offer up the whole Hegelian, Hegelian dialectic. The problem-reaction solution. There you go, they're already... With all this... Tracking stuff, digital ID, 2020 stuff, and this patent, and all this stuff, like, that's the solution they're going to provide. And they're going to make it seem like, it's going to do, I'm not saying that there's no good things that are going to come from it, but they're going to, that's what they always do. They create the problem, and then they create the solution as well. And the solution will create other problems. And there it is right there, global governance. What a shocker. It says protect fundamental freedoms, but in accordance with national legislation and international agreements. So basically, whatever the New World Order deems to be a fundamental freedom are the ones that they will protect. Freedom of speech? Yeah, who knows if they'll protect that one, you know? Maybe, maybe they won't think that's important enough to protect. And see, this point right here, like, on the surface, like, it seems like it could be a good thing. Yeah, that's how they that's how they always sell it to you. They never whenever they want new technology or systems, they never tell you the bad parts of it. They just say the good stuff of it or stuff that they could do and they all usually they just say, Oh, this could cure cancer, this could cure cancer, blah 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 with the whole CRISPR stuff, but that's a completely different video. One thing about cash is it's not as easy to trace as something like this. And with this, not only yeah, it might make it easier and more convenient but for you, but they'll trace literally every single thing you purchase. That's one thing. Like, cash is one thing they can't control, like, fully. Because you can buy something and they don't know 
your habits based on that, unless you use a card, which most people do, or whatever. But now, literally, I have no choice but to give them that information. The more information they have over you, the more power they have over you, and that's just how it works. They want control of everything. Literally everything. Yeah, it's for achieving... It's a prerequisite for achieving many of the other STG standard goals of development goals or whatever, probably. So yeah, this is all tied into the Agenda 2030. And there it is again against trafficking. They're pushing that as a, as a reason to, for tracking. Okay, here is this. New technology, including blockchain, when used in conjunction, conjunction with long-proven technologies such as biometrics. Yes, biometrics. Now make it possible for all people to have access to a safe, verifiable, and persistent form of identity. So, biometrics. Measurement of physical characteristics such as fingerprints, DNA, or retinal patterns for use in verifying the identity of individuals. Let's see what else it has to say. Measurement of biological data. Measurement of recording of physical characteristics of an individual for use in subsequent personal identification. It's very much biological. Like, identification, that's what it is. They're demanding, this, this is hilarious, a more seamless digital experience and Increase privacy, like, dude, they're gonna get the complete opposite from this, like, it, that just, that, it's like doublespeak, that's literally doublespeak, it's like, they're saying it's increased privacy, but it'll give you decreased privacy, it's just, it's just ridiculous. And then one final thing I'd like to add, like, the let no good crisis go to waste, whatever, that's been, um, the quote has been attributed to so many different people, like, I don't even know who it's actually from, but, if this is just like the next 9-11 thing, when that happened, like they have more power, more security, and once they get that power, did they ever give it up? No. They kept it like that for years to come. Just like, if they implement this kind of stuff, even if it's not like the end or the mark or whatever, even if it's just another precursor to it, and another step in that direction, if that's all it is, they're not going to take it away once they gain that power. Like, it's there. They're not going to give it up. Even after it ends or whatever. If it does. Just like the whole Patriot Act. They didn't end that after a while. They just kept expanding upon it and expanding upon it. Like, and kept making it worse and worse. So, whatever legislation or whatever ideas they end up going with this. Like, if they implement it, they're not... Probably not going to give it up after a few years. And I'm not saying any of that stuff isn't real. Like, I'm not saying, oh, 9 11 never happened. I'm just saying, if they have an excuse, if any, most governments, if they have an excuse to gain more power, they'll, they'll use it. Like, that's how it works. That's how the world works. Thanks for watching, Ryan. If you think this is important, if you learned something from this at all, please share it with people, especially people that are, like, worried about everything that's happened, like, this is important information. I know I didn't really share that much stuff that nobody else has really talked about yet, but I just wanted to get everything I know out there, and this is one thing that I really need to, to talk about. So, and yeah, I'm, I don't have ads in videos or anything, so it's not like I'm going to benefit from it. Like, I just wanted to share it if you think it's important information that other people need to know about. Do your own research, come to your own conclusions and stuff. Yeah, thanks for watching, everyone. I will see you.